Well, I, li I like that they walk in the room and the lights dim. That's I, 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 I got to do that more often. Um, hello, everyone. This is uh, John Frankel. I'm a founding partner of FF Venture Capital. And I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I want to thank our sponsors. We have some great sponsors of our Insight series. This is the um, uh, one on cybersecurity. So if you think it's on another topic, now's the time to um, head out. Um, but we host a number of events each year. Um, uh, and as I say, I want to thank our sponsors, including York International, uh, MacArthur in English, Eisner Ampner, Trailblaze Growth Advisors, and Cushman and Wakefield, and also Appella for hosting uh, this wonderful event. As, as many of you know, at FF Venture Capital, we're seed stage investors across a number of sectors, including drones, robotics, AI, and cybersecurity. We're in cybersecurity is a space that we've invested in over a fair number of years. We have a half dozen portfolio companies in the space, um, including Doc Authority, um, which protects organizations unprotected uh, sensitive documents, Distill Networks, which stops websites being scraped and attacked, uh, Secure, which is a leading and rapidly growing um, uh, identity verification company, CyberX, which protects industrial networks uh, against attack, Ionic Security, which is a recognized leader in uh, cloud, end-to-end -end security, and Great Horn, a top player in the spear phishing space. So why did we pick cybersecurity as a space to come and talk about today? because it's increasingly relevant. Attacks, number of attacks last year grew 60-fold. That's a lot. The, um, the amount of ransomware attacks last year that were made public was in excess of a billion dollars, which I think, let me have a trip. Yes, it's about three Bitcoin at today's latest price. <laughs> You know, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. You know, the WannaCry virus, which attacked enormous number of machines, um, actually hit an interesting intersection of they want to be paid in Bitcoin. However, the people running Windows machines who would pay a ransom and the people who understood how to pay in Bitcoin were so different. I think they, the, the ransom, despite the number of attacks, I think they, it was only about $30,000 um, that ends up being paid. And as you connect more devices in the home, uh, there's just more points of attack. You remember that great, that target attack, which was well publicized about three years ago. They came in through the HVAC system. So in an interconnected world, there's more and more risk. And that risk is important from business risk, it's important for insurance, it's important from a whole series of errors. If you look at staffing, the estimate is, you know, and this is from Frost and Sullivan, that by 2022, which I guess is five years from now, there's meant to be a shortfall of 1.8 million people. The demand for expertise in this area is growing. And that's why it's of interest to us tonight. We're very fortunate to have some experts in the field come and talk to us about what's going on. Um, my partner, uh, Ryan Ambrose, is going to come up and take the podium and uh, lead the discussion tonight. And I want to thank, as I say, everyone for coming. And uh, I think we're in for a treat. Thank you. How's it going, guys? Um, thank you, John. Uh, I'm Ryan Armbrust, a partner here at FF uh, Venture Capital. 
and I was supposed to say that we will have food, uh, some more d'oeuvres afterwards, so if you stick around, uh, they're, they're, we'll feed you. Uh, but just, just to be sure. Um, I want to welcome Jessica, Tad, and Michelangelo here. Um, I'm not going to speak too much. I'll get right into letting them introduce themselves uh, and, and hopefully provide you guys with some information. Great. Um, Tad Melnicki. Uh, prior to entering the private sector, I spent about 12 years working in the national security community for the U.S. government. Uh, started my career hunting uh, chemical weapons uh, with a focus on Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, moved into uh, terror networks, uh, finished my government career hunting uh, IED bombers in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. And uh, while I was working with that Department of Defense organization, we had a, uh, an intelligence fusion center where we had the uh, budget uh, allocation to be able to start experimenting with new technologies, uh, data analytics and cybersecurity technologies to be able to get advance of the threat, which is how I started getting into cyber and since then have been working with uh, Fortune 5s, startups and uh, foreign nations uh, to shore up their threat lines. Hello, my name is Jessica Robinson and I'm CEO of Peerpoint International. We focus on bridging the gap between physical and cybersecurity for businesses. And we work with both uh, larger businesses and smaller businesses. Prior to the work that I'm doing now, I work for Target Corporation. I worked with them for nearly 10 years. I started off with them in Washington, DC, moved with them to Philadelphia, and then I moved with them here to New York. So um, I also worked out of their headquarters in Minneapolis, so I did a lot of flying back and forth. <laughs> uh, a lot of my work was really on supporting the stores and helping to make sure that they were safe. Uh, so focusing on physical security, helping to do data security training within stores, um, and a good, a good portion of my, the second role that I had with them was actually on public-private partnerships. So actually working with law enforcement at the state, local, and federal level to help make sure that we had strong partnerships with them as it relates to either concerns within our stores or as it re uh, uh, related to concerns that we were having at headquarters. Um, so yeah, I'll end there. Hi guys, my name is Michelangelo Cidani. I'm uh, the CTO and co-founder at NOPSEC. NAPSEC is a New York City-based uh, vulnerability risk management uh, solution provider. We basically focus 100% on uh, offensive security. That means uh, uh, the company started uh, to as ethical hackers, uh, meaning we get hired by banks and financial institutions and, and other folks to hack into their system uh, so the bad guys cannot do that. Um, prior to that, I basically like have about 20 years of experience in uh, penetration testing. I started my career back in Europe, uh, in uh, Italy and in London, and then I moved uh, in, through various organizations uh, to um, consulting uh, firms to audit most of the uh, Fortune 500 uh, here in the United States. So it's been um, you know, quite a ride, and I'm here to explain you uh, what is, uh, is that all about? Awesome, thank you guys. Uh, so to give everybody a little bit of a, a frame of reference, which is obviously a, a pretty broad topic here tonight, um, you know, maybe we could each go through and, and sort of speak towards any specific issues or ideas that you're specifically focusing on or looking at or think are very interesting in the space today, yeah. kind of framing your point of view for, for everybody here moving forward. Yeah, so for me right now, I think, uh, there's an abundance of technical solutions out there and a real sense of market saturation uh, in terms of uh, on the technical side. So I've really been focusing more on, uh, on the human side of the threat equation, uh, both from an inside perspective, but also from uh, how, the outs how, how outside threats are, are, are affecting uh, not only companies, but governments. Um, and I think that a lot of the problems that we're facing are largely come down to just a lack of education um, in an incredibly complex topic. And because this is an issue and this is a threat that is constantly changing minute by minute, day by day, the education necessary in order to understand and respond to the threat is constantly being pushed farther away from the decision makers who really are the ones who need to have this understanding. So uh, we focus on three different things right now as kind of topics of interest. And one of them, as I said earlier, is bridging the gap between physical and cybersecurity. Uh, so I left Target shortly after the data breach, and that's when I went full time um, with PurePoint International. And 
we, at that time, our strategy was to focus on how can we help businesses really think about the physical security threats as it relates to cybersecurity. And it was, and it was everywhere that I went, people would laugh at me and say that they didn't think that it was realistic and how could one company focus on both. But the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, my experience was that we did need to focus on both. It was what I saw personally working in the private sector. And it was something that I was seeing with other companies as well. And so working with financial institutions, working with uh, law firms, that's one of the things that we do is really kind of uh, be that go-to go -to area for businesses that are really looking how to do that best. Um, and I think now with the new uh, DSF, uh, New York um, DSF laws and regulations around, and for if you're not familiar with what that is, it's the new cybersecurity regulations as it relates to the financial institutions here in the state of New York. Um, I think that the work that we're doing is really supporting a lot of those institutions. Um, the second thing, which I'll just say quickly, is really the work we're doing with startups. Um, it's been a lot of fun to actually have startups really kind of think about how they are incorporating security into their either software infrastructure and life cycle or just thinking about cybersecurity as how it relates to that being, um, having a plan around that as an asset for the business. And, and then the third thing I would say, I mean, the human piece is huge. I mean, you just can't get around it. And it's helping organizations to think unique about it, particularly if they don't have a large budget. So we're thinking things that, like organizational design. And I'm sure everyone in this room can, can say, what does organizational design have to do with cybersecurity? But that's just an innovative approach that we're trying to take that can be cost effective for organizations to be able to focus on cybersecurity and, and brainstorm different ideas around that. Yeah, so my perspective is more like, you know, uh, focusing on offensive security, I said before. Um, basically, like, uh, we focus on uh, three aspects of it. One is the detection of the vulnerabilities. Um, again, not all the vulnerabilities are created equal. Some are, are exploitable, some are not exploitable, meaning attacker can cannot take advantage of them. Um, some are more relevant for a certain environment. Uh, and certain organization because they have a certain assets that are at risk and high value, some are not. So um, really what we focus on is like, a, you, know, you know, detecting this vulnerability with the reliability, obviously, because you don't wanna, you wanna avoid the, the, the pitfall of a false positive. So false positive meaning um, uh, a scanner will detect the vulnerability when, it, when it's really not there. Or, for example, a SQL injection um, is, not, is not there, is not exploitable, so the, the scanner or the engine, the detection engine made a mistake. So the second aspect is a really, uh, as I mentioned before, the prioritization of this, of this vulnerability. Um, you know, are, are these vulnerability created um, you know, and correlated with a, a public exploit or private exploit? Are they zero day, which are very few and far between? Are they, um, are they incorporated like we're gonna talk about with WannaCry a little on, um, are related to like malware, for example, so that's increased the risk of the vulnerabilities. And for example, at the other component, are these vulnerability really a lot talk about in the social media. That's another component, another aspect that we really look into it. And the third one is uh, almost a forgotten one is the remediation because finding the vulnerability says like you, you have it there. Okay, go ahead and patch it or remediate it. Well, not so fast, not so mm -hmm. easy because mm -hmm. everybody says like, uh, you know, they seem to have like an excuse and obviously, there are production systems that cannot be touched, and otherwise they get like you know, you know, broken forever. Um, you know, we're going to talk about you know how to do remediation and why to do remediation. So let's start. You, you brought up WannaCry. John brought up ransomware. You know, we could we could start there a little bit just because I think it's topical and interesting. Uh, you know, kind of biggest issues or takeaways from from. You know the vulnerability that's still there, and I mean, obviously, you're attacking individuals, to hospitals, to corporations. You know, what should people be doing? What's kind of the biggest issues or takeaways that you could you can come with? I, I mean, I think from it's different from the individual perspective. What can an individual be doing versus what should like an enterprise be doing? Uh, for me, I think it goes back to what your previous question, which is what is the number one issue we should be focusing on right now? And for me, it goes 
to the human assets. Mm -hmm. um, so providing that education for your workforce, providing that education for the people who are sitting on your network and inhabiting the network, having an understanding of the policies that are governing, governing the data controls um, and the data segmentation. Um, you know, it's surprising how many companies aren't utilizing encryption, aren't utilizing uh, the policies necessary in order to determine who needs to see what. Everybody in the enterprise doesn't need to see every piece of information that the enterprise is processing. And there are technologies out there that make it very simple to encrypt and segment. Why aren't we doing more of this? And we're not doing it because the consumer, the buyer, doesn't have the education necessary in order to accurately buy the technologies that they need. Yeah. Um, I would say the top question that I was getting, um, or I should say the top answer that I was giving to people the day after the WannaCry, and I wrote a blog post and I sent it out, uh, but it was all around patching. Because at that point, we just wanted to make sure that if there was a bleed someplace that we could stop it, or if they could, if the people that I'm working with, if there was a potential opportunity for them to be a victim, that all, everything that they have, all the technology that they have is updated. And so um, I probably had two or three of the tips that I gave out were around patching, um, and then the, the email responses that I put, uh, that I had were really around patching. Um, and, and this went to also, um, uh, you know, I had one woman that asked about her personal computer, and I just said, you know, make sure you have all your security updates um, were, were completed. And so, I mean, for me, to me, that was my biggest takeaway with WannaCry. Yeah, so, um, again, as I said before, like, the, the, the crossroad between malware and vulnerability. So, you know, WannaCry is based on, like, basically, um, an SMB, like a, a, server, a server message block vulnerability that was patched in March by Microsoft with the patch MS1710. So in theory, this was before kind of like the NSA tip Microsoft because uh, they knew that this was kind of leaked. And it was leaked through like basically they, you know, and this is known information. I mean, uh, they they have operation server that throughout the world way, where they base all these tools. They, there's a so-called hacking tools. There's zero day, and uh, one of those got compromised. So who, whoever got compromised that server got a big stash of uh, you know zero day. Um, so when he, before it leaked in the open, kind of like NSA tip off Microsoft saying like. Um, you got to do something about it. So, like, basically, they work night and day to issue the patch. But um, the security community, like, like us, the literally the three day after, we we're like literally screaming on top of our lungs, saying like, "You guys have to apply this. <laughs> this is like the perfect storm." Yeah. And really, nobody, you know, seemed like to kind of register this fact. And and I do get that production server might be broken. and But I also know very progressive and mature organization that they rather break their production system rather than being compromised and end up in the first page of New York Times. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's not a matter of saying, like, oh, I want to do it, I want to do it. It becomes sort of a political internal issue. and. Um, is also um, basically um, a, a direct, has a direct correlation to the security maturity of an organization. Mature organization, they, they are willing to break, break stuff in order to make them secure. So I mean, if we go from there, you're talking, you just spoke of an organization that was willing to break, you know, Live product in order to patch. No names. No, no names. No, no, I know. No, no, no. <laughs> but you, you can take that. And, it's based in New York, but big. And that's a very much a, that, that had to have been a, a that had to have been a top level decision of saying we're going to break this. Right. You can take that all the way down the scale to a, to a CISO, to an IT person, to an individual working uh, an individual working and getting spearfished. Like, how do we handle who should be responsible for what and at what time? I mean, it's great to say we need to enforce policies, but if you can't actually make an individual worker not open a PDF, uh, you know, that, that's not security, that's just human, you know, error. Well, that's right, but you have to train the people to be able to respond, right? Like, or see it. Or to see it, or to be able to catch it, and you have to have the, the, the you know, 
it, it's not only a human response, right? There is a there are technologies available that help us push. Uh, it, it, when we were working bombs, we had the term left of boom, right? So boom is the, the big event. You want to get as far left as you can. Yeah. So there are technologies that help you predict, that help you spot things at the firewall, uh, that that enable you to get as far left of boom as possible. But at some point, you, you do have to train the people that are sitting on your network because the people that encompass your network are always going to be the weakest vulnerability point inside your security apparatus. So do you see that, do you see that as, as tools for those individual workers or for IT to push down? I think it's IT's responsibility yeah. to know what they're doing. But there's a difference between an IT professional and a cybersecurity professional. And that's where we're starting to have problems, is that you have a lot of IT people running around looking at the problems the way that they would normally look at you know, a server breaking down. But a server being hacked and a server not working are very different issues. So that's interesting. We, we can segue there briefly. You know, as cyber becomes more intelligent and, and a, a bigger threat, and are we lacking in, in cyber expertise within corporations? Will technology make up for it? Or how do we push that gap together in the future? Yeah, I mean, I'll throw this number out and then I'll shut up. By, 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 by 2019, we're going to have a 1.3 million job shortfall worldwide for, uh, uh, in cybersecurity. We can't catch up. So we're, we're already behind the curve. We're already 10 years behind the curve. So technology isn't enough to catch up, but it's the best chance we have right now until we start actively training. Okay. Yeah. Um I think to answer your question, we do need more people with cybersecurity expertise within the organization. I think what we can also do, because we, we do have a shortage, is we can take a look at some of our great IT professionals that are there and really have the company start to invest in that talent and help to make sure that they have the right certifications around uh, cybersecurity. Um, I think that that's something that can be helpful. But when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the end user, I think that. Uh, it you know it is it, you know they do need to be engaged and we do need to make sure that we are um, you know if the if we don't have the cybersecurity expertise within our organization that we're partnering with uh, technology partners that can come in and do. Uh, uh, testing around spear phishing, um, that can do testing um, around other scams and any other thing that can cause the, the end user to click on something that they shouldn't. And uh, the other thing that I would say is you know, we can start to get a little bit innovative around how we're working with the end user as well. So uh, I've worked with different organ because a lot of this has to do uh, with productivity, right? I mean, if we can, if we think about how many emails we get a day and how many times we just click on something simply because we're not really thinking about it, we're just clicking on it because. Uh, we just we just need to get through this email, or we just, you know, or we got something from our boss. We just need to click on it to read it quickly before we, uh, you know, go on or go into the next meeting. Well, sometimes if we can just kind of train ourselves and train our teams to really stop and think. And uh, um, I've known organizations that do things like email uh, email free hours. Um, they do things that allow them to be able to, or, or they do things like if someone's on your floor, you're not allowed to email them. You actually have to get up and talk to them, which may not always be popular. How do I get email free hours? <laughs> can you teach me that? Yeah, well, it's if they're working on a project. Well, I mean, you can't, awesome. you can't forget an email from, you can't keep an email from coming to you, but you can not respond to an email, and you can just focus on whatever project that you're working on. And you can actually go and speak to the person that's sitting next to you versus trying to get up and email them. And so every every work environment is different and days are busier and depending on what's going on with your organization. So it needs to be specific to the organization and to the team. Um, but there are ways that we can help our teams in terms of productivity that then can have an output on the cybersecurity results that we're seeing within our organizations. So, so you were asking about, you know, who's responsible for like ultimately uh, like a, for cybersecurity, I would say like, you know, I use uh, an expression that you know is a little bit dated, but it's called like the tone at the top, meaning the management is the really the one that have to buy in, um, especially the board. There's a lot of uh, conversation with the board that um, basically like cybersecurity means business. See, if um, if uh, God forbid you get compromised, uh, all your flaws uh, and all all your value all of a sudden get you know, flaws jacked up and value diminished. And we, we, we know, we read, read all the studies about, 
you know, um, depression of a stock price because of, you know, uh, cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying, like, is I totally subscribe, you know, that uh, basically cyber uh, security is a combination of the human element, the technical element, and the procedural element. You know, human element is often forgotten. Security element is often often forgotten because most of the pen testing we do, we literally compromise security. We walk in, uh, we plug something into the little tiny appliance in, uh, into the network, and all of a sudden we are in, and we make an external physical security into a logical pen test. So you understand how this thing is morphing, and also like uh, um, basically like also looking at what we call adversarial simulation. So you look at blue team, so the mm -hmm. defender. Yeah. Yeah. They really go now, they're yeah. starting, my colleague, they go uh, and take training as an ethical hacker penetration tester um, uh, to learn the techniques of the bad guys, and specifically those guys that have a lot of budget on on their side, meaning like national state and highly motivated individual mm -hmm. that yeah. goes uh, for the tar target, not they just don't do like you know a generalized uh, phishing spam and hoping for the best. I mean, mm -hmm. these are the kind of guy that you know we want to mimic uh, the the test, uh, and that's the reason why like you know you, you should really do all the organizations should do like adversarial simulation tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just. To pick, on, uh, pick up on something that you said, at the end of the day, it is a leadership uh, focus. And so within your organization, it does come down to the CEO, the executive team, and the board. And um, being able to really see this as the cost of doing business nowadays in today's world. Cybersecurity is the cost of doing business. So just like staffing is the cost of doing business, or marketing is the cost of doing business. And so. Um, I think that uh, you know, not for organizations or for uh, to not invest enough time or, or um, and I'm not going to say necessarily financial resources, but depending on the, the size of your organization, it, it may be financial resources into this area. Um, you know that um, you know that that may be irresponsible <laughs> for a, of a leadership team to not take it seriously enough. Well, and I think there's also a burden on us as security professionals as well to kind of help break down and simplify mm -hmm. these issues. Yeah. You know, rather than r wrapping this term of cyber around it, which, you know, there's so much that go that goes into this, like, this word cybersecurity now. Mm -hmm. well, let's focus on the core. It's a data security issue, mm -hmm. right? So if you secure your data, for the most part, you can feel pretty good when you go to sleep at night. Sure, you may have some system compromise, but if, you know, unless you're running a dam or a nuclear facility, system compromise isn't gonna topple your business mm -hmm. for the most part. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but mm -hmm. this is a data security is issue. So to us in the security field, when the, the leadership comes in, we have to do a really good job at making this approachable and making success achievable in the near term mm -hmm. and not just trying to you know scare them into submission scare mm -hmm. them into contract because yeah, I you know we all see that yeah, every day definitely. people go in oh, I'm gonna right. scare them and they'll sign right. with me yeah that's horrible it's horrible it's called fun yeah <laughs> you know, certain the end up. yeah <laughs> so well, well not every organization can do can do pen testing I mean you know yeah. it's expensive and when we talk about everything from, you know, I know there's a lot of early stage uh, focused folks in here all the way up to, to large corporations. What are the smartest industries, what are the smartest corporations and companies doing to stay ahead of the game? What, what are they, what, what's the minimal they should be doing? And what are the, the people who are really, you know, above and beyond taking care of themselves? What, what, can, we, what can we share with you? I mean, they're, they're adopting policies and procedures that comport to their workforce um, without impacting day-to-day -day business. Um, I think that's that's the primary. I think larger companies that are, you know, I, pen testing, and I will defer, <laughs> isn't as expensive as I think a lot okay. of people think it is. I mean, you can find incredibly talented pen testers who are gonna do a really good job. I mean, they may not crawl your entire system. They may not, you know, do, you may not be able to afford two, three weeks worth of work, but you can certainly afford a, you know, a very, 
tier one look at what's going on in your system from a highly qualified pen tester. I think in the larger enterprises, it's if you're going to bring these people in and you are going to utilize cyber operators, um, create an environment in which they can work. The average cyber operator stays in a job from 15 to 19 months because that's just who they are. They get very antsy. They, they don't work normal hours. They don't wear suits. And so we have to create an environment that makes these talented people want to stay and want to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would say for, let's say you're a smaller company and you really don't have a lot of the financial resources to invest. There are a lot of just kind of basic things. And so the kind of the rule of thumb that I say, if there's, you know, if you, if there, if we were to go through a list of tactics, um, let's say nine tactics, smaller organizations commit to at least three. So let's say make sure that you guys are changing your passwords every 30 days, that you have a BYOD policy, bring your own device to work policy. Uh, you want to make sure that, let's say you can, you have a little bit of a budget, then you partner, then you can partner with a cybersecurity expert or someone that can come in and that can help you assess where your data is, uh, that can help you assess how best to protect your data, particularly if you're using a lot of different areas to store uh, your data. So a lot of small companies I find are using Dropbox. Well, that's not always the best place to have your documents, right? Mm -hmm. So really knowing that and knowing how best to protect your information is really important. So I'll say that for, for smaller companies. For larger companies, those that, are kind of, that have the budget and the resources that are operating on the higher end, I see that they are, um, they're finding a way to somehow hire all the talent, the talent that they need. They're not really at goal, but they're hiring the talent that they need and they're investing in it. Um, they are doing things like red teaming and bringing in companies that um, are testing their networks and um, um, that are hacking them. And, um, and I think, and I'll say this last one because I think it doesn't matter whether you're a large organization or a small organization, but one of the things that we're seeing more of is industry associations putting out guidelines around cybersecurity policies. And you don't have to be a large company to be able to find out in your industry what your, what your industry association is and what their cybersecurity guidelines are. And if you can start to follow those, that's a great roadmap for you. Yeah, so um, for a smaller what you brought up before, like for smaller startup, I'm gonna address that, you know, and I'm gonna use like, a, you know, this time I'm gonna use like a, you know, a buzzword, like there's a, such a thing, uh, you know, nowadays that, that, that a lot of people talk about, you know, DevOps. Well, mm -hmm. DevOps is actually a practice of um, basically like develop, development operation within the organization. So the developer or like in, in even the infrastructure team, the sysadmin, can basically build um, uh, test-driven development and into the development, the system development life cycle and also bring in as part of that um, security testing. So let's assume you don't have a budget uh, for a red teaming or for like external penetration testing, but you have a very good dev dev DevOps uh, team that knows what is like uh, continuous integration or continuous de development I I is. Some of our clients, what they do is um, they include in that automation the in invocation of the scanning of their web application or their environment. So every time they push code, they can potentially cause a regression and security holes, that means. Mm -hmm. They, they basically like a scan as well as like so they bring the detect, the detection component, and so they can they can fix the problem before they they can get into production. So I think like there's a lot of things that an organization, a smaller organization like a startup, can do if they have the you know obviously the expertise on uh, you know uh, this kind of development, uh, test driven development. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and you mentioned we've mentioned policies, and we've mentioned you know new New York regulations, specifically for the financial industry. Um, you know, I have a, have a note that a recent NCC investigation showed that 57 percent of investment management firms are are failing or behind cyber risk assessments and vulnerability tests in their in their areas, in their organizations. Sorry. So, you, what are some other industries that you think we're failing in, and and, and where where you where people are probably trailing and have some uh, need to catch up a little bit on on what they're working on? as far as protection? I think the healthcare industry is ah. starting to do a much better job of it. Um, but I think it's because you're starting to t uh, see people take uh, the data security guidelines that is that already exists inside HIPAA yeah. more seriously. 
Um, and I think you're starting to see regulatory bodies uh, starting to see the protection of private health information, the PHI, much more seriously. Um, so I think the healthcare industry as a whole is starting to do much better. Um, financial services, uh, you know, SEC is pushing more regulations and more guidelines surrounding the protection of the data sitting on the systems yeah. and third party usage of that data. So I think that's going to start increasing. I mean, look, w w right now we're asking for regulation and I'm sure we're going to get to a point in the not too distant future where we we hit that apex and now we're, you know, and then we'll start screaming for less, you know, less regulation. Um, so it's really a balancing act right now. Okay. Yeah, I'll say that uh, having come from the retail sector, I think the retail sector is actually doing a lot better. And so there's a lot of work that they're doing inside the Retail Industry Leaders Association and other associations to do a lot of information sharing um, and really hosting cyber summits. And, you know, and, you know, from my experience, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of good information sharing. So I, you know, I can only imagine that that's continued over the past couple of years. Uh, the second area that I, I think you know, I would say is that, um, I th what I would say is there's more awareness with law firms and law associations and uh, the Association of Corporate Counsel. I can't necessarily say they're getting better. I don't know if you guys would say that, but there's definitely more awareness uh, in that area. And it's extremely important because of the work that they are doing with large corporations and other businesses, large or small, because they are that trusted partner. So they're kind of that critical partner that I think we're all constantly supporting uh, to really make sure that they are really at least at baseline, if not ahead of baseline. And then the, the last thing that I'll say is kind of the real estate and title industry. Um, there's been so many different uh, wire transfer <coughs> schemes that have been going on there, a lot of phishing attacks, and um, they're doing, they've been doing a lot of work there by really making sure that industries are focusing on, uh, that companies within that industry are focusing on guidelines, but uh, it's still, particularly for smaller companies, it is so incredibly challenging. And a lot, you know, they're not experts. And so, if they're a small company, they're not experts. They many times don't even know where to begin. Um, but they still handle large contracts. So, if you are if you're a smaller organization, but you're still doing you know two million dollar contracts, and all of a sudden you know, two million dollars goes missing, that's a really big deal. Um, so, it's really continuing to help those uh, companies through the pain points. Yeah, as, as far as the, um, the sector goes, I mean, you guys, uh, um, you know, kind of answer, um, you know, cover that question uh, very well. I mean, what I will add is, uh, specifically for the retail, mm -hmm. you, you work at Target, you know, like all the retail and all the people that handle, like, you know, credit card information are subject to uh, compliance, like but with HIPAA, I'm sorry, PCI and, you know, healthcare HIPAA. But what... Uh, what I want to say is um, the compliance is the minimal, minimal standard, but doesn't equal security. Mm -hmm. And we have seen time and time again business being compromised. They were PCI certified. They, they were like declared HIPAA compliant, mm -hmm. but still they got compromised. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that they adopted, they took that compliance standard as uh, done it all, and that should be like very, the very, the very minimum. In fact, I, I tell my clients like you know when you when you inform your security program um, in a way that is well structured and risk based, you're automatically compliant mm -hmm. because that's the minimum standard for all the sector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, you know, kind of like uh, regulators at left and right have to like uh, yeah. listen to us more more often than not. <coughs> I mean, we've said nice things. Let's say something bad. Uh, IoT manufacturers need to do a better job. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, the explosion of the IoT market, the amount of devices that are hitting the systems, uh, the lack of regulation, the, act, the, the lack of ability to control. Um, they, they need to take a greater responsibility um, for the amount of weak points that they are adding into the system on a daily basis. Yeah. And they're not. Um, some of the larger companies, some of the, the, more, the, the tech companies, the, the Googles and Amazons in the world are doing a little bit better than others. Not to say I would ever put an Echo in my house, personally, <laughs> um, oh. ever. Um, but, yeah. you know, the, the, the non-tech origin companies yeah. are not doing a good enough job at putting devices on the market that come standard with a level of security that is better than the bare minimum. 
So what is a consumer can, can, on the consumer side can you do besides just not utilizing this new fancy flashing technology that's being pumped at you from everywhere to protect yourself in those sorts of situations? I mean, I don't think it's just about utilization. I think it's about looking at uh, the line between uh, convenience and necessity. Um, I think that's helpful. We, we were talking in the, in the, in the back room before. Um, what, the, the, the larger companies will do a fairly good job, like Apple does a really good job at when, it's, when it uh, finds a security flaw, they push the update. They're not pushing that update just for the hell of it. They're doing it because there's a reason. Um, I'm always surprised when I talk to clients for the first time and I say, show me your iPhone, open up, the, you know, open up your settings, and let me see if you have the most recent version of iOS on your phone. And the vast majority don't. Why? Well, because I'm afraid it's going to mess up my calendar view. <laughs> OK, great. Then don't call me in three months right. when they went through, you know, your, you, you know, yeah. they went through that that soft spot in the system and ended up hacking the information off your phone. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think it's just it's, it's it's common sense procedures that aren't well known enough at this point and are are just starting to get out there more and more. Yeah, and if I may, like you know, I want to add like no corporation will do anything that is not required to do. So like I totally subscribe what you were saying, like I mean regula regulation are essential in this in this uh, field. For example, uh, I don't know if you guys have any, you know, if, are, are parents, if you buy um, any like toys, electronic toys, and I'm not going to mention the company because you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give a bad rap. I mean, um, obviously they're they're really concerned about like the safety standard and you know the shape and the non toxic but they totally bypass the cybersecurity. So yep. like all of a sudden, this can be like uh, the video camera can become like you know zombie part of a botnet, and then you like the, the the picture of your child it gets distributed. Who knows what other things? So I mean, like it's it's a kind of a like again the maturity has to like grow. And the cybersecurity has to be included in those regulations in a specific sector mm -hmm. that might not be included, mm -hmm. like in others. Yeah, yeah, those are great points. Um, the one thing that I'll add is, is I think what's obvious is that we're not living in the same world as we were 20 years ago. We're not even living in the same world as we were 10 years ago. So everyone in this room just has to be a better consumer. We have to be an educated consumer. So as you're going out and you're selecting the products that you need that you think are going to be connected uh, to your network, you should be asking questions like, what are their security features? Uh, particularly if there are products that are being going inside your body. I had an opportunity to meet the CISO of Johnson & Johnson. And she spoke in front of an, on a large audience. And she said, you know, she was talking about this new product that they had and that they were testing. And it was related to diabetes. But she said, there is no way that this is going to be hacked. It's not possible. And of course, she took a lot yes. of flack, right? Yes. <laughs> She's like, oh, there are tons of hands that went up. Uh, but she stood her ground. And she was like, it's not going to happen. And she bought up other products, heart monitors that had issues. But she says, it's not going to happen to us. And so I mean, that's, that's a lot of confidence for her to get up and say that about her products. So I wonder how many other CISOs would be willing to say that about their products. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but just be an educated consumer. Ask a lot of questions, particularly when it comes to the, the health, the health products. And so as we move from, from Alexa and Siri and Google Home to, to, to smart diabetes monitors, how do we start to think about autonomous cars and, and you know, semi-autonomous cars and you know, fully connected you know, killing machines, essentially? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, no? It's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's terrifying. I mean, th th three years ago, the government was you know, utilizing Bluetooth technology to listen in on conversations sitting in foreign individuals' cars. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's not a far jump to see somebody taking actual physical control of the drivetrain system on, an auto, uh, you know, on something that's automated. Um, and so I, I, I forget, uh, God, I forget who it was on CNBC the other day said, you know, we're a lot further away than we think we are. And, and I think that just kind of made me take a deep breath and go, oh, OK, good. I'll, okay. You know, I'll worry about that in another like, three Further years. away, which direction? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> further, <laughs> further away from seeing you know, the, sh the streets of you know, New uh, York City you know, dominated by you know, automated, automated cars. cars and yeah. you know, I, I think we're just, we've, we've made a lot of, uh, 
we've come a long way on the on the automated car issue very quickly, okay. but I think there's this this wall that the industry has hit, and to get over that wall, it's it's not going to be as quick uh, as it was to get to the wall, mm -hmm. or maybe that's just wishful thinking. <laughs> you're, I'm you're, also a control freak, so I don't ever want to turn the driving over to. You're just punting on the security <laughs> sure. Well, I think I think this one I, I have to give it to like you know. Um, the security researcher, the, the automotive industry uh, consider their uh, piece of equipment, um, you know, like a, a laptop or, you know, a desktop, and therefore, like, hire the best hackers, uh, the best hacker, the Google hackers, meaning, like, mm -hmm. uh, the best security researcher in the, in the world to, you know, probe and, you know, take a look. And at the very beginning, as I know, like um, they were reluctant. They said, like, no, because then we have to re-architect the entire system. Well, you know, you architect it wrong. You know, like a network. You know, mm -hmm. if you want if you want to secure a network, the first step is to architect it correctly. So the car, they went back to the drawing board, and obviously the stake was high, right? And then they went back to the drawing board, and then they said, like, well, maybe we should. Uh, we should put the, like really the key system behind the firewall and you know segment <laughs> the whole car like you know network mm -hmm. otherwise yeah what i would say to kind of going back to your answer to the last question is that because technology is so pervasive um, and that and security is so pervasive within the technology car companies as much as they're writing lines of code to be able to support their products, which are cars, you know, they're slowly not, you know, automobile companies in there more. They're slowly becoming software companies. And that's how they're going to have to see their company. And so there also needs to be a mindset shift within the automotive industry to say that we are a software company. And so I know that they're, you know, they're, they're one industry that's in the process of, of hiring, like, Tens of thousands of cybersecurity experts, because you know even now a car a car today has like something like a hundred hundred a hundred million lines of code. Yeah, million, yeah. With, you know a fighter a uh, uh, you know F thirty five fighter jet has like you know I don't know fifty million maybe. I mean, and we're as we go to autonomous cars, you know, in the next couple of years, well, we'll just I'll just say vehicles in the next couple of years, you know, um, apps and autonomous cars. I mean, they'll have 200 million lines of code, and so the way that car companies operate today is going to be very different than the way they operate even five years from now. Yeah. So I think as long as companies that are creating products for the Internet of Things, as long as they start to see themselves, you know, and really admit, okay, we're in the software space then I think that that awareness will help them to be able to hire the right talent and, and really have the right security features. But it's, it's super scary. When you brought up the F-35, I mean, before uh, they were even able to deploy the F-35, they actually had to go back and relook at the security architecture because what they realized they created was a flying IoT device. And so they had to actually completely redo uh, the security architecture to apply a IoT security architecture to what was originally being done as just a, a straight up systems architecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so, you know, how many billions, trillions of dollars were spent to get to that last point to then have to figure it out. It's no surprise then that, you know, Uber based their autonomous program essentially on the campus of Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Um, and I think you're going to see more, uh, you're going to see more car companies investing at the university level because they need the talent. If they don't go and grab them there, it's going to be hard for them to get them. One more quick question, and then we'll, we'll open up to, to audience questions, because um, we're kind of talking about the future. Um, if we think in all these this pricing and these ICOs, if we think you know future internet protocols are based on blockchain and crypto, how do you see that evolving into you know general security uh, to a networked world? Very broad question, but yeah, yeah I, I mean. I'll take it in a slightly different direction. I'll, I'll look at just the, 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 the encryption technology on the data that we're producing and that needs to be secured right now is there. Yeah. I mean, you have a company sitting in your portfolio, Ionic Security, um, that has a, a, a really strong encryption product already. Um, so it, it, it's already there. I think part of the problem that we're, we're just seeing going forward is that these encryption companies are seeing their sales time timelines uh, elongated uh, because you have an uneducated consumer who just 
is not ready to pull the trigger on an enterprise buy, even though they know they need it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say, you know, um, I think, I feel like it's still early, but it's really, yeah, but even though it's been around for almost 10 years now, I, I think that it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. I definitely think it is here to stay. That is what I would say. And um, I think it's been interesting to see when it comes to blockchain technology and uh, cryptocurrency, particularly blockchain, to see the financial sector really jumping in, because when it comes to cryptocurrency, and they could easily, uh, you know, they could easily be a, uh, wiped out as an industry. Uh, of course, they would never let that happen. So, um, you know, to see them saying, hey, what are the benefits of, of this? How could we use it? Uh, well, if we could use it and it can lower transaction costs, and if we can use this and it can open us up to a new market of customers, then why not? And so I think, I think, it's, I think it's interesting and I think it's fascinating. And, um, and, um, and I've seen it when it comes to even um, the diamond industry and how it can best protect diamonds in the future hmm. um, when it comes to um, the government and how it can really support governments um, and not just in the developed world but then de in the developing world I think it's absolutely fascinating and it's um, and so I, I definitely think it's something that'll that'll be here to stay and I will say like you know in terms of um, all the crypto you know it's good to <clears throat> test it take take it in the open test it as much as much as uh, research like um, and this is a little bit, you know, we open up a sort of another Pandora's box, box here, but do not backdoor it. Meaning crypto is crypto because it's locked. Yeah. You know, if you put a backdoor or some sort of like, it's not crypto anymore, so not only, and this, I know that is a fairly political, uh, but uh, so um, you know, so I don't want to upset anybody. But <laughs> it's it, it, it it's a me meaning like a you know weakening crypto basically like mm -hmm. weaken the general public, yeah, yeah. Definitely. like everybody yeah. else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, don't put an escape hatch yeah, on safe. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have safe this really big, safe. expensive yeah. door. It's yeah, amazing, and then you have a latch right. that, do that. You know, controls the escape hatch. <laughs> and, and with that, I think that we'll be hanging out for for a little while. Um, I think we have wine and and, and uh, hors d'oeuvres through about 9 p.m. Uh, I'm sure if you can you can ask questions directly. Uh, I'd like to thank Tad, Jessica, and Michelangelo for for coming up and, and speaking with us tonight. Thank you guys all for being here. Um, and let's. Head back out to the nice view. Thank you guys. Pleasure. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you guys. Thank you.